Hello everyone and welcome to Talking Business with me, Danny Pardo. On this episode, I'm chatting with Rebecca. And I'm not going to give too much away about what Rebecca does, but I will say that if you haven't heard of hybrid air vehicles, then you need to find out about them. We will be talking about this amazing organisation throughout the course of this episode, as well as technology in general, sustainability, the environment, and a bit of marketing and communications thrown in for good measure too. So without further ado, let's talk business with... Rebecca. Hello everyone and welcome to Talking Business with me, Danny Pardo. We've got Rebecca here with us today. So hello Rebecca, how are you doing over there? Good, thanks. How are you? I'm very well, thank you very much. And thank you for joining me. I really appreciate you taking a bit of time to chat. Uh, we're going to get stuck into all things technology, environment, sustainability and air travel today, uh, as well as throwing in a bit of marketing and communications. And before we do that, though, we need to find out who we're chatting to. So let's kick off with a hard question here. So who is Rebecca? Well, Rebecca is a transplant, so I think the first most important thing is, obviously, I am not from the UK. (laughs) I grew up in the United States, um, and essentially, I'm now the head of communications and external affairs at a company called Hybrid Air Vehicles. been doing communications marketing my whole career. Awesome. Okay, so in terms of your whole career, then, let's take it back a little bit before we get stuck into hybrid air vehicles here. Let's take it back a little bit, or uh, however far it needs to be, uh, to when you were 16, 17, you know, you're in uh, high school, I presume, starting to leave high school in the state of 17, 18. Um, did you think that in the future you would be head of communications and external affairs in England for a uh, air travel uh, company? No, I I actually intended to be an equine veterinarian. Um, So my entire childhood and teenagerhood was spent trying to be a veterinarian. So when I left for uni, um, I was 17 when I I went to uni, um, I was studying animal science and the plan was to be a vet. And that stayed the same for a while until actually my last year at uni. And then I thought, "Uh uh-oh, I don't want to do that. Now what do I do? (laughs) So I went through a little bit of a career wiggle and uh, tried a couple of different things and ended up in community sport communications, um, yeah. actually. And uh, I'm not entirely sure how I ended up in aerospace, but these things happen. <laughs> and here you are, yes. Was was there like, um, I'm curious, was there a light bulb moment in your second, third year degree where you go, I've wanted to do this for, say, three or four years, and then, oh my. I mean, do you just wake up with that feeling? Is that a gradual thing? or how um, did that happen? So I actually got very lucky in that. Um, and and it wasn't something I wanted to do for like three or four years. I mean, I was teeny tiny kid when I first said I wanted to be a veterinarian. Um, so it was a whole life thing. Um, I got to work for a veter- veterinarian, an equine veterinarian in the US, um, a really amazing one, actually. Mm-hmm. And I loved it. But I realized that, you know, people tell you to choose your passion as your work and I think for some people that's probably true but for me it really wasn't right because horses were my entire universe you know I I rode horses competitively it was a part of the family life it was super important to me it still is and I came to the realization that if I became an equine vet it would consume my entire world and I wouldn't have time for horses for fun Mm -hmm. And I'd be around them all the time, but not able to have the kind of passion for the horses for fun that I did. So it, um, it wasn't overnight, but it wasn't like a long gradual process either. It was something that happened over a couple of months of doing work Mm -hmm. where I realized I love this too much and I need to make sure that I have some boundaries between my work and my life. Otherwise my life is going to go away. Um, so, and, and I think that's the right choice. I think, I think that was the right thing for me because even now in a job completely unrelated to horses, it does take over everything yeah. um, because that's just how I work. So I can only imagine what it would have been like with horses. Yeah. So, it, I mean, even finding your passion and working with your passion, sometimes there are limits to it because your passion uh, needs to almost, well, not almost, definitely sometimes be a need a, re- a release, um, a, a change. You know, if you're doing the same thing all day, every day, okay, great. But when, where's the enjoyment from that? So that's really interesting to hear, you know, love what you do, um, but be careful with it. And I know you've got a passion for sports as well. So is that where the natural kind of, Pro, uh, kind of route went for you then so what do I love next yeah. and sports was um, it, was, you, it was kind of an accident actually many things in my life have been accidents um, and in some respects like uh, if I could give people any piece of advice it's be willing to go th- oh different a different direction than you think mm-hmm. you should be going 
um, because you never know what might happen. Um, so after I finished my degree, I actually, um, the World Equestrian Games, which is like the Olympics for horse sport, came to my hometown. And so I volunteered because I was like, well, what else am I going to be doing? Um, you know, I'll volunteer. What a great opportunity. And they ended up hiring me um, as the assistant manager of the language services division. Um, so we did all the interpreters and, and uh, written translation for the whole of the games. And in doing that, I realized I can do sport as a job. This is a job that people do and travel all over the world doing this stuff. They get paid so, and everything. I, mean, I know. What a, I mean, they don't get paid very much now, in fairness, no. um, the big sports events people. But, you know, most of the people I worked with were doing um, every two years, they were moving to a new place for the Olympic cycle. Mm -hmm. So they'd gotten to live in amazing cities doing this incredible job. Yeah. Um, it's really intense, but it's an amazing thing to do. And then you watch the sport flourish in front of you mm -hmm. and kind of know, oh, I, I built that. That's cool. Um, so I looked into doing a degree in sport management and amazingly I got in and went and did an MBA and a sport management degree. Um, and in that time focused mostly on motorsports. My thesis was on brand personality in Formula E racing. And that's what brought me to the UK. So I wanted to uh, try and chase the dream job in F1. I did not get the dream job, just before anyone wonders. Um, and that's totally okay. <laughs> I didn't want to ask, you know, I thought I yeah, felt yeah, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, You know, the reality is that like, dreams are a far away thing and it's really important to have nearer term goals and be flexible about how you acquire those goals because mm -hmm. I've been able to have a pretty amazing career and I've never worked in motorsport formally mm -hmm. um, like I've never worked for a racing team and that's totally okay and I have no regrets about that if a racing team calls me tomorrow and says hey you want to come and be our head of comms I'm probably going to say yes uh -huh. um, <laughs> but it's you know that it, it, life takes funny directions. You've got to be open to it. Sure, yeah. And, and I'm just going to throw a curveball in here because you said Formula E. Um, I'm fascinated by Formula E and I've shown it to some of the students and they never heard of it. And that was really surprising to me because I thought, I, I knew it's not as mainstream as other forms of motorsport, um, but I thought they would have at least heard of it and they hadn't. I mean, what, what are you seeing with Formula E? Because that's been around for a while now. That, that's not necessarily a, a flash in the pan, uh, let's try it for one year kind of thing anymore, it doesn't feel to me. Um, I mean, what, what's your feel of it working in, you know, in the industry a bit closer to it yeah I think um and I've always felt that formula E is really important um it's what's been very interesting is when it first started everyone was really skeptical um that one it was going to be able to survive it would be good racing all of those things it turns out it's brilliant racing mm. it's really really good racing every race is high quality mm. um but what you're starting to see is that manufacturers see it as what formula one used to be where they could use Formula One as a technology test bed. Now that's starting to happen with the electric racing, which is really interesting because new companies are going into racing, like Jaguar being involved in Formula E, and then JLR committing to doing uh, no internal combustion engines from 2025 or 2030 or whatever they've committed. So those, those things are starting to come together. I think obviously there's still a long way to go. It's, it's nowhere near Formula One in terms of fan awareness, um, but, I think it's on the right track. It takes a long time to build that. And I think definitely finding ways to get young people excited about motorsport is a, a challenge for the sector as a whole. Yeah. Um, and you kind of hope that things like e-racing will help with that. Um, and some of the younger drivers in Formula One who have, you know, on a random weekend when they're off, they'll do sim racing on Twitch and they get like hundreds of thousands of people watching them on Twitch. And that's completely new to racing. That that's that didn't exist before. So I'm hoping that we'll start to see younger people interested in the electric forms of sport. Yeah. And yeah. there's also Extremey, which I think Extremey is really cool because that's electric and off road at the same time. Which yes. Is yes. And uh, that that's quite that's a bit new, isn't it? And I, I only come yeah, across that a, a couple of weeks back. Um, it reminded me of the old um, the old Paris Dakar rallies and things like that, and and then this kind of new generation of it, um, and it yeah. was fascinating to watch that. But you're right, you know, in terms of a testing ground, um, that that was kind of my thinking with regards to 2030 in the UK being the cutoff for um, new petrol and diesel cars. So whether manufacturers like it or not, it's coming. And you might as well get on board now. And uh, it's great to see some of the brands actually doing that. Um, so talking about, you know, environmentally friendly transport and things, that's a nice segue, isn't it? Um, hey, there's another transport method. When's that catching on? <laughs> I don't know. 
you know, it's interesting because Segway was a little bit ahead of its time. If you yeah. look at what's happening with, with mobility scooters now. Yes. E-scooters in Birmingham, yeah, we, you can rent them. And... Exactly. So, and, and e-scooters have been around elsewhere in the world other than the UK for a while now. But if you think about like when Segway first kind of hit the market, it was a little bit too expensive. Mm -hmm. It was a little bit too hard to use. It didn't really fit into the way people thought about moving themselves around. It wasn't seen as a mode of transport. Whereas now the very humble scooter, electrified, yeah. has suddenly become like a core part of what city transport looks like. And it kind of mirrors the experience of like electric cars and any kind of groundbreaking mechanism of transport. You know, the first one always seems a little bit like, Ooh, we're not sure, but the reality is that's the right path. It's a good path. And Segway was just too early. It was just a little too early. Yeah, and it always it felt like extremely weird. Yeah, <laughs> it, it, yeah, and it felt gimmicky, didn't it? And I, yeah. you know, I, I remember it as um, I think there was the, the mall cop movie, and it's, yeah. it's for security guards in malls and shopping centers. And you're like. Oh, but I don't want to look like that. Um, but now everybody's hiring scooters and doing exactly the same thing yeah, and paying for other, it. The other thing that's happened since Segway really is a change in infrastructure and not just physical infrastructure, but also digital infrastructure. So when you hire a Lime scooter now or a, a Bird scooter, you're doing that through an app. Mm -hmm. And when Segway first came into existence, that was not a thing that happened. So if you think about now, not only is it digital infrastructure from app design, it's digital infrastructure for banking. So you can make that transaction instantaneously. It's using near field communication to unlock the, the scooter. It's all of these technologies that had to get to a certain level of maturity yeah. before they could be rolled out. You know, things like GPS has come on leaps and bounds, the ability to lock the scooter so you can't roll it down the street when it's not in use. Mm -hmm. All of those technologies had to kind of reach a certain level before the underlying technology, a scooter, which PS we could have built 25 years ago, it has to, we have to reach a certain point where that becomes possible. And you see that in lots of things. There are some companies in Europe, in Spain in particular, who are doing like canisterized hydrogen. So it's like a little canister the size of a thermos flask that you can get from a dispenser and return into a dispenser that you then screw in to an e-bike powered by hydrogen. Wow. And that's like, that infrastructure challenge is extraordinarily big like we really underestimate how important the infrastructure is building the bicycle and making it go by hydrogen is the easy part it's everything else about that exchange making it safe making it fast making it actually functional and not cost too much mm. all of those pieces of the puzzle had to fall into place too yeah fascinating because obviously segways were early 2000s late 90s early <laughs> 2000s if i remember correctly when even the idea of all having an app on a mobile phone was was a completely foreign concept let alone everything that you're talking about here that we just take for granted and get on a scooter and go traveling um so speaking of traveling then um hav hybrid air vehicles um you know we've been uh, fortunate me and my students to chat to you before a little bit about this but um I don't know how long you've got here. What's hybrid air vehicles, Rebecca? <laughs> so hybrid, hybrid air vehicles is an aircraft manufacturer. Um, so we're a, we're an OEM in, in the parlance of the business world. So an original equipment manufacturer. Mm -hmm. Essentially, we're a team of engineers who have designed and built a full-scale prototype of a new kind of aircraft technology. So at the moment, we are the only people in the world who have flown that at full scale, and we're getting ready to enter production. So the aircraft itself, gets 60% of its lift from the buoyancy of helium, which is essentially what we would call free lift. Mm -hmm. um, you don't have to generate power, use power to generate that lift. And then the other 40% we generate just like an airplane. So an airplane gets its lift by accelerating through the air, which as the air goes over the wing, generates lift, mm -hmm. and then you fly. Because we need less power to do that, we're much, much more efficient than an airplane. And equally, we're able to adopt electrification technology early. So We'll be able to use hydrogen fuel cells in a hybrid electric configuration from 2025 which is much much faster than other large aircraft yeah fantastic i mean how long have you been how long has hybrid air vehicles been working on this and you're still bringing it to market i say still and that sounded a bit negative it didn't mean to um you know because obviously the testing process and the technology as you move forward uh how long has this been taking to get to this point now where you're starting to really get um out there in the public eye a little bit well, HOV has been in existence since 2007. Mm -hmm. um, the bones of the technology existed before that. So some of our um, engineering team have been working on these problems for, for a long time. 
um, the need for the technology has existed for a long time as well, although that's, you know, the, the market had to catch up with the need as well and the commercial market. Um, aircraft, aircraft development programs are really slow, right? It's, it's kind of a, it's why when you hear what companies like Airbus and Boeing are talking about, and they're talking about designing new hydrogen fueled aircraft for 2035 mm -hmm. as concepts, yeah. you know, that's a long, that feels like a really long time from now, but the reality of designing new aircraft is it's really, really complicated. Um, we were very fortunate to get to first build quite quickly. So we've been able to test and modify and test and modify in an iterative process prior to now. So now we're ready to go. Um, and all of that work and investment and time is behind us. And there's still work to be done. It's not like it's all done, um, but we are now at a point where we can actually speak to customers about something they can buy rather than a design on a page. Yeah, and, and it's, I remember we were looking at it in class and, and me and my students as well. Um, and we, your promotional videos say how far it can go, how long it can stay in the air. And um, I remember you tweeting about when the Suez Canal blockage happened earlier in the year and, and the absolute carnage and mayhem that one ship was able to cause. Um, and then the knock-on effect to thousands upon thousands of companies. Um, I mean, my students were saying, oh, well, that, that takes a long time. How much can it carry? Why would you ever use that? Just put it on a boat. Um, so, so, I mean, what, what's your thinking with that when it comes to using it as a distribution tool for organizations? I think if you think about the transport ecosystem, the car, let's think purely about cargo transport ecosystem. Mm -hmm. I think most of that ecosystem is hidden from view for most people. So we walk into, you know, uh, we walk into um, any grocery store and we buy something off the shelf mm -hmm. and we don't really think about where that's come from and how it's gotten there. Um, we have two options essentially, right? We've got Air freight, which is extremely fast. Obviously it's as fast as a plane flies. Mm -hmm. It's very expensive and it's extremely carbon intensive. At the other end of the scale, you have sea freight, just like those big ships that go through the Suez Canal. Um, every TV you buy, most of those TVs will have come to you on a, on a boat. Um, most of everything, your shoes definitely come to you on a boat. Um, and it takes a long time. It's much less carbon intensive. Shipping, shipping is actually relatively speaking, <laughs> in the grand scheme of things, reasonably uh, environmentally friendly. Um, so you, you kind of have those two choices. And then the only thing that sits in the middle is rail and road. Mm. And rail and road is great, except for the fact that it only goes where rail and road is. You can't go anywhere else because your train only goes on the rails. It doesn't go elsewhere. So where we sit is we're faster than the surface transport options and we're more environmentally friendly than the air freight options. So yeah, it's not gonna get there in 12 hours, but pretty much everything that can get there in 12 hours could survive if it got there in three days, it wouldn't be a problem. Mm -hmm. But the other alternative is three weeks on, on the ship. Mm -hmm. So there's this huge gap in the middle where it's a kind of a medium speed, low footprint type of shipping. The other advantage of an aircraft like Airlander is we don't need infrastructure. Mm -hmm. The aircraft can take off and land from anything flat. So as a result, you look at uh, depot to depot, direct transport. Yeah. If you imagine you're like a, an Amazon or a DHL or one of these big shipping companies, they've got these huge depots and basically they, they do what's called uh, multimodal transport. So they basically take your parcel from the depot into a truck, from the truck to a plane, from the plane to another truck, from that truck to a depot, and then into the van to get delivered to you. Imagine if you could go from the depot to the depot in one hop, one, how much fuel saving you'd be making, yeah. and two, how much more efficient that would be. So there are a lot of applications where being able to operate away from the existing infrastructure opens up all sorts of different interesting options for you. You can skip over borders. Uh, you know, there's, there's a lot you can do where you won't have to, on a train, you know, every border crossing you have to stop for customs. Don't have to do that when you fly over the border. Yeah, I, I can see that logistical challenge just being reduced and reduced and reduced and reduced and the paperwork and the bu bureaucracy and the administration and, and all the staff members that, you know, need to be doing that. Just get rid of that, save the money and save the time as well. You know, that, that could be massively time consuming. So you were talking about time. Once you get that out of the way as well, then, then how amazing is that? I mean, are you seeing a shift in people's views then to go, 
oh, we, we do need to be more environmentally friendly as well. You were talking about footprint there. I know that's a key word that's banded around a lot. Um, and it's been used a lot in marketing and advertising at the moment uh, by the government down to small organisations. So are you starting to see like a real shift of people who would use um, HAV towards going, you know what, we need to do something? Yeah, it's, uh, it's amazing how fast it's all changed as well. I think if you look at passenger travel um, in Europe, about 47% of flights that happen in Europe are shorter than 370 kilometers, which is really short. And most of the airplanes flying those routes were designed to do much, much longer routes. And airplanes are at their least efficient when they're at the short end of their design range. Um, so we know that there's demand for those short routes between cities. We can see that that's a huge problem from an environmental perspective. It's really hard to decarbonize. And companies all over the place are starting to realize that the pressure on aviation is only going to go up from here because every other industry is also under pressure to decarbonize. So although right now aviation makes up a relatively small percentage of emissions annually, mm -hmm. it's predicted to be something like a quarter of emissions in future. And it's not necessarily because it's generating that many more emissions, it's just that everybody else is getting better. Um, and I think we're also seeing um, the attitudes of people changing. So, you know, business travel is different today than it was two years ago because oh, yeah. of the pandemic. And so we're starting to understand, I think, that the new world is going to be a different experience than the old world was. Um, so just because we take a little bit longer doesn't necessarily mean that's a problem. It just means it's different. And certainly I'm, I'm amazed how willing people seem to be to sit on an aircraft for 12 hours to go somewhere. They, they seem fine with that as long as it's comfortable. Whereas, you know, it, it, when I grew up, it was get there as fast as you possibly could. But we were able to burn fuel willy nilly then because we didn't understand what we were doing. Um, so it's amazing how, how much people are looking for a way to decarbonize now as soon as possible. Yeah, and, and so interesting to hear that uh, I mean, you mentioned that the majority of flights are short, too short for the plane to reach kind of maximum efficiency. And we've been looking at transport, but on the ground, and the majority of car journeys are small car journeys, um, a couple of miles that can be done with, like we were saying earlier, e-scooters, um, proper public transport, uh, e-bikes or normal bikes, because their journeys aren't even that long. And it's like you're taking that kind of the thing that we can associate with, that, yeah, I do just jump in my car um, and burn fuel and I do just jump in a plane and burn a load of fuel uh, and things so it's, it's fascinating to take it you know up a bit in terms of physical space um, and look at it from that perspective uh, and, and also you talked about the short hops there now you were very busy uh, a couple of weeks or a couple of months back uh, <laughs> I think that's an understatement isn't it I mean are you okay talking about it are you uh, you like oh no I've got to do the spiel again but <laughs> you were very busy um, and getting a lot of mainstream media coverage uh, with regards to the, the short uh, I believe it was passenger hops and connecting cities that aren't normally connected. Uh, you was, I was seeing names that like, oh, that's not an airport city. Uh, what, what are they doing there? Um, so, so what else for hybrid air vehicles, distribution, transport, cargo we've spoke about? What about passenger side then? What, what's coming next for, for you there? Yeah, so we've just revealed, um, it might have been a month ago today, actually, um, the concept interior for our passenger um, passenger mobility aircraft. So fundamentally the aircraft is the same aircraft, but we've redesigned the interior to have up to hundred passengers mm. and do those short hop flights as, as you say. So the example in the UK we use most often is Liverpool to Belfast. Mm. At the moment, if you wanna go from Liverpool to Belfast, you have to get on a plane or you have to take an exceptionally long ferry. Um, the ferry is like nine and a half hours. It's really, it takes, it takes a really long time. And flying is fast, but both of those airports are actually outside of the city center. So if you're in Liverpool city center, you then have to go out to the airport and then in from there. And it becomes like this whole thing. And you're also generating an enormous amount of- And that's the multimodal that you were talking about. Uh, Amazon exactly. distribution warehouses using that. I want to go here, so I've got to use car or train or bus or plane. I mean, oh my gosh, when I get there, I've got to use car, bus, train, coach, taxi. I've got to do all these kind of things to get from here to here. Um, so obviously- And it's not only that, when you get to the airport, you know, most of us have been in airports, right? Airports are actually marvels of efficiency. Hmm. They don't feel that way most of the time. You know, you get to an airport, there are a lot of people who have to check in. There are a lot of people who have to go through security all at the same time. Everybody has to wait together. 
if you imagine a terminal dedicated just to airlander flights mm -hmm. closer to the city center mm -hmm. your aircraft has up to 100 passengers so even if you're doing a lot of people it's a tiny fraction of the number of people who would be moving through an airport at any one time so even if everything else about the experience is the same, which it doesn't necessarily have to be, mm -hmm. you'd go through much, much more efficiently. It would be much less painful. It would be much less crowded. It would be a much more comfortable experience. Mm -hmm. And then you go from that to getting on an aircraft that's like a flying lounge. It's mm -hmm. not like getting into a tube with wings. It's not pressurized. It's not noisy. It doesn't rattle you around and spit you out the other end. It's a completely different travel experience. Mm -hmm. So you start thinking about, it's not just a question of the in the air bit. It's not just a question of, is this a like for like swap? We're talking about a future ecosystem of how people move around that's completely different. And it comes back to that same point about infrastructure, doesn't it? So, you know, we look at, we look at how transport ecosystems can be built. And the fact that our infrastructure is very minimal mm -hmm. means that this is not something that if a city wanted to have one of these, it's not something that you'd have to spend tens and tens and tens of millions of pounds developing and pave half the half the greenfield sites and build these huge buildings and have hangers everywhere it is not like that at all so it starts to look quite different you can imagine a world actually you know you talk about like micromodal and last mile to car journeys to longer journeys if you think that you can get on an e-scooter from your house go to an air taxi terminal jump in the neighborhood air taxi, go to the city center airlander terminal, hop off and jump on what is essentially a larger scale mass transport type application that flies you to a new city. And then you jump back in an air taxi to go to where you're going. You can start to see how that paints a different future than we have currently. Yeah, and it, and it feels, I know chatting to the students, there's a few wide eyes that, oh, that, that's more like a movie than um, re realistic um, what's actually going to happen. But you can obviously see the uh, importance of it and where you're really feeling that need from a business perspective that this isn't offered by anyone and it needs to be because of these reasons. And that, that's absolutely interesting and, and really kind of um, eye-opening to see. I mean, have you, have you dealt with... The, the image being seen as kind of gimmicky or unrealistic or, oh, that's too far in the future, we'll never get there. Um, because I know some of my students were like, nah, that's not going to happen. Um, have you dealt with that as well from the marketing point of view that you've had to go, like, just think just for a second, <laughs> you know? Yeah, uh, so we, we get a lot of questions about the Hindenburg yeah. um, because, of course, you know, that's when people think something that looks like an airship, the immediate image they get in their head and whether it comes from having seen the Pathé footage or they've watched the TV show Archer, it could come from anywhere, but- Or the Led Zeppelin, Zeppelin album cover. Oh, it might exactly, be the Led Zeppelin you know, album cover. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of like ever present in people's yes. mind. And um, my CEO says something that's really true. He says, after the Titanic sank, people didn't stop getting on ships, yeah. did they? They didn't. They, no. they actually were getting on ships every single day after the Titanic sank. And after the Lusitania sank and after every other famous, you know, shipping disaster, we just get back on boats and it's not a problem. Um, we've had a number of airplane accidents and people get back on airplanes. I think the difference is that because it's not super well understood and people don't really know the change in the technology. Mm. You know, if you think about that was 80 something, 90 years ago. Oh yeah, it, it, you can't and compare it. Everything, well, it's like, the, what would a telephone have been like back then? It would have had a crank and you would have been like shouting into a transmitter. <laughs> That's right? right, yeah. And now my entire universe is on one of these. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's nothing about that is comparable in a lot of ways. I think the, it can't possibly be real thing does happen as well. It helps that we have actually done it. We've flown it in real life in full scale. So we can show people video footage and say, this is the aircraft actually flying. Um, that really helps. Um, it's a source of some frustration for me, though, because people look at the flying taxis and they're like, oh, yeah, that'll totally work. Mm. And yeah. it's like, um, yeah, talk to somebody who has to certify those and tell me what you think after that. Yeah. I remember <laughs> the stories. I think I can't remember what it was last year or so. And it was uh, somebody was testing them in Paris 
I don't know if it was Uber or somebody, and the students were like, oh, yeah, I'd get one of them, I'd get one of them. And then you look at yours, you go, oh, no, no, that's not going to You're like, really? <laughs> you, you, yeah, you imagine looking out the, the windows and seeing a thousand flying taxis flying around. You know, you think that's more realistic than that, but that is a perception that, that we're dealing with. Yeah, it, and it's, it's, we do a lot of work to help people understand, one, how it works. Mm -hmm. What is it? How does it work? How is it different than the things they have in their heads? Mm -hmm. We've got a lot, we produce a lot of content about that the other thing we talk about a lot is certification mm. um, because we are going to be type certified like every single airplane that you get on to fly that process is the same now some of the rules are slightly different mm. but there are still rules it's not like there are no rules we still have rules we have to follow we still have minimum safety requirements that we have to exceed there are, there's still stuff about emergency exits and seat belts and all of those kinds of things are, are going to have to be factored in just like they are with an airplane. So we help people understand that actually at the end of the process, when you buy a ticket and get on one, you should be as confident as you are getting in an airplane. And actually in many respects, the aircraft is extremely safe because by design, because it uses lighter than air technology, we actually have much, much slower speed. Mm -hmm. So our crash case is different than it would be for an airplane. The hull is full of helium, which is inert. It'll actually put out a fire. Um, we're not using jet turbine engines. You know, we, if we've got four engines, well, the Euros are on, right? So imagine a football pitch. If you put an engine at each corner of a football pitch, that's how far away our engines are from each other. And we can fly with just one. Wow. So even in the crazy, unimaginable event that three of the engines failed, we're fine. We can still land just like normal as if nothing has happened. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's stories like that that you know, it doesn't feel like a marketing story, but at the end of the day, our customers buy an aircraft that they then have to sell to a consumer yeah. and you have to be comfortable buying a ticket. So part of my job is to help my customers' customers feel safe. Mm -hmm. And when you're doing something new, that's a really important part of the job. Yeah. How interesting. <laughs> it's fascinating. And uh, just getting over that perception uh, of, you know, where are we? in terms of safety and uh, where are we going and are we even ever going to travel again with COVID and all those kind of things? I mean, what's, what's the last year or so been like for you with regards to COVID? Has your business kind of just dropped off or have you seen businesses really going long term that, oh, there's going to be a change, maybe HAV can really help us here? I think in the beginning it was very difficult because... Mm. Um, a fair number of the people we were speaking to as customers were in the travel and, and tourism space. And obviously that's a sector that's been extremely hard hit by COVID. So especially at the beginning, before anybody had any clue what was really going on, before we really understood what the route out of COVID was going to look like, it got very, very difficult to have sales type conversations. Um, in the like kind of second half of the pandemic, it's really changed. Um, because especially around the mobility space, people are thinking differently about how they travel for business and pleasure from point A to point B than ever in my entire career. It's, it's completely different now than it used to be. And it's been really interesting to, to interact with people who are really thinking about carbon footprint and really thinking about aviation's role in reducing emissions globally. Yeah. and turning to us because we are the people who are doing that. Yeah. Um, so, you know, that's not to say it's all been sunshine and roses. The pandemic has been awful for us, just like it's been awful for everyone. Um, you know, I'm working from home. This is not my office. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot that has changed, but I think we're coming out of it in a very different place than when we went in. And that's a good thing. Yeah. And, and what's next then for, for HAV in terms of timelines? I know you only have to put the news on and there's, there's, um, when we talk about, well, climate, uh, we have to be carbon neutral by 2050. 2030, we're uh, stopping petrol cars. Um, there was supersonic flight, wasn't there, in the, in the news a couple of weeks ago, but that, that's trying to make a comeback, and that will be done by 2030. And it, it's, it's hard sometimes, I think, to plan that far ahead when we've been so kind of, what's happening tomorrow? What is this world we live in? Uh, but in terms of, you know, realistic business expectations, when, when are we looking at for looking up in the sky or booking a ticket for um, HAV, whether that's distribution companies using it or me and you traveling from Liverpool to Belfast? So the aircraft, we expect the aircraft to be in service with customers from 2025. So that's when you can buy a ticket as a passenger. Um, we have to do some flight tests before that. So we'll be in the air from 2023. Uh, so we will be flying around a bit and then people will see us before you can buy a ticket. Um, 
that's really fast, right? 2023 is not very far away. Um, so it'll come around really, really like, That's 18 months away. <laughs> uh, basically. So, and then we'll be all electric by 2030. So, you know, you think about, um, you, you mentioned like kind of the longer view. I think aviation talks in very long distance thinking because it takes so long to do aircraft development. I think as an industry, we have to confront that because building the first hydrogen aircraft in 2035 is not soon enough. We've got to, we've got to accelerate the process if we're going to be net zero by 2050. And the reality of aviation as it stands today is it will have to be net zero. It's not going to be zero. Um, so, you know, even the International Energy Agency acknowledges that aviation is likely to be one of the few sectors that continues to use fossil fuels beyond 2050. Um, but we, that doesn't mean we can't play our part. You know, we do have to try <laughs> to, to decarbonize on the way. We can't just coast along like that. Yeah, just quit now. Just like, well, we tried. Yeah. yeah. And, and you know, there are probably some in the industry who would like to take that approach. Um, it's definitely not an industry that has thrown its entire being into decarbonizing. You know, we talk a lot of, the industry talks a lot about sustainable aviation fuel. We don't make enough sustainable aviation fuel in the world to fly the number of planes we fly. We just don't. So it's not a viable, you know, it's, it's really nice to say, and it is important, but it is not the be all and end all of how we decarbonize the sector. And businesses, HAV has been very good about saying, this is practically what we can achieve. Yeah. And we try really hard to stick to that. Um, I think everybody else is gonna have to step up. I, and you, I mean, you are. So <laughs> we've had, uh, we've had a shadow of a doubt. I'm so excited to see what happens with HOV, and uh, I'm really, really fascinated to see where it goes. And, and I really do wish you all the best for it. It's it's really, really exciting. Um, I'm going to ask you one more question, if that's all right, and then we'll wrap things up here. Um, I think I might have asked you in class. I'm, I can't remember if your answer is going to be the same or not. Um, so let's take it back to you then, and, and thinking about where you are now, where you were um, for the students really if you could go back to when you were say 17 18 and give Rebecca a little bit of advice or you wish somebody had given you some advice and you'd listen to it taking it on as kind of a mantra what would that advice be um I don't know if somebody gave me this advice but it would be take every open door mm. because you never know um you never really know what path is going to give you stuff um, so I think it's really easy, you know, when I was 17, I was completely committed to one career. I knew exactly what I wanted to do. And that was the only thing, um, in hindsight, I wouldn't have changed that because I think that's part of who I am. Um, but in hindsight, I think it's really important to, um, I used to teach writing lessons and I told students, you should have a dream, you should have a goal, and then you should have a thing that you're working on today. Um, and the dream is I want to be an Olympian. Every kid, when you do sport, right? Every kid who does an Olympic sport is like, I want to grow up and be on the Olympic team. Okay. So five people every four years get selected for the Olympic three-day eventing team. So your chances are really small. That's not to say they're impossible, but they're really small. So let's pick some achievable goals in the medium term. And then let's set ourselves some tasks that we do right now today. And I think if, if I could say anything, it's think that way about your career too. Dream jobs are really important. You've got to have a long-term view, but be pretty creative and open-minded about how you achieve the steps to get there. It might be a sector you didn't think you wanted to work in. It might be maybe you wanted a marketing job, but you take a communications job instead. Or, you know, maybe you decide you want to go back and do different types of school, or you want to not go to university and, and do a, um, you know, do a technical, uh, do technical studies instead be open-minded and let any path that opens ahead of you be willing to consider it because you never know where you end up. Is, I definitely is, wouldn't be here if I'd planned for it. <laughs> that is an understatement, but <laughs> it really is. Yeah. Oh, thank you so much. I mean, I don't know how many times I've said thank you to you over the last year for all your help that you've, you've given with me and my students um, and now for a, a bit of a wider audience as well. So um, stay on the line just for a moment, if you would, we'll say a proper cheerio then. Um, but I, I'll just say thanks and your insight and your experience and your, your stories are absolutely brilliant. And uh, yeah, all the best to HAV, exciting times ahead. Um, thank you. Yeah. And thank you very much for talking business and uh, we'll see you again and uh, cheerio bye a big thank you to rebecca for taking the time to chat to me on this one 
Hybrid air vehicles sounds absolutely fascinating and a complete game changer in the world of transportation, both for logistical distribution purposes and for me and you, regular paying customers. So I wish Rebecca all the best, hybrid air vehicles all the best, and all the best to everybody watching and listening as well. You can like, share, rate, review, subscribe, and do all those good things. I really appreciate it on your favorite podcast platform or on YouTube. And if you want to say hello, then you can do on all the social medias. Just have a look for Pardo's business and you'll find me. And until next time on Talking Business with Danny Pardo, I'll just say cheerio.